You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Today, we're lucky enough to have with us Jojo Moyes. Jojo is close to about a dozen best-selling books now, including The Girl You Left Behind, uh, The Last Letter from Your Lover, and two that we'll be talking about today, Me Before You and One Plus One. Both books deal with the concept of the attraction of opposites. Each deals with this attraction in terms of love, wit, banter, and choice. Each has similarities, but the subject matter is at times 180 degrees apart, although the two protagonists uh, in each book, along with the coterie of well-polished characters um, that in part drive their journey, share similar traits. The main thing, however, is that you know if you're opposites in the material world or in day-to-day -day waking reality, it in no way affects your ability to perceive love, sometimes belatedly, and to recognize whether all turns out well or not, that the effort and the emotional reward is well worth the sometimes arduous journey. In JoJo's book, sometimes it's better to have loved and lost, which actually really sucks. And, s <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's really, really good to have loved, stayed in love, and lived happily forever after. So welcome, JoJo. It's, it's, it's a pleasure having you here today. Thank you for having me. So here's the thing. I'm 62 years old. I read science books. I read Nikolai Gogol, David Edgar, science fiction, James mm -hmm. Joyce, blah, blah, blah. I hear that I'm interviewing you. And I look at the two books and I go, no, 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 these books are for women, they're romances. So I start with Me Before You and all of a sudden I'm completely caught up. I read it in one sitting, I start at 10 p.m. So I finish at three in the morning, thank you very much. And at the end I'm crying, I am not a crier. And then two days ago I start one plus one, finish it in three hours. And at the end I'm crying again. So I won't tell which book was Tears of Happiness and which was Tears of, you know, not sadness, but loss and kind of not lost. So the point is, what are you doing to me? Do <laughs> well, you've just made my week. <laughs> well, do I have to read all, all of your books now? And <laughs> am I going to turn into some simpering old man who's going to cry at McDonald's commercials? Yeah, it's all part of my evil plan, really, to put men in touch with their feelings. Yeah, I think there's either something wrong with me or something Discover wrong with you. Discover your feminine side. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, you know, that is the really interesting thing, and especially since the advent of e-readers, I've had a whole lot more male readers because they don't feel embarrassed about picking up a book with a girly cover. Right. And so many of them um, tell me that, you know, they just enjoy the stories. And uh, I, my favorite email ever came from a welder in England who told me that he'd read me before you after his girlfriend had, had read it and she'd got very emotional. And he started reading at work, and <laughs> another welder came out to the backyard where he was reading and, and found him and was like, what are you doing, man? You, why are you crying? And he said, I, you know, I was really embarrassed, he said, and, and my colleague went home and came back the next day, and he'd started reading the book, he said, and so I'm just writing to tell you that yesterday afternoon you had two fully grown welders weeping in a backyard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that made me so happy. <laughs> There is something wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that makes me feel a lot, a lot better, actually. Real uh, men can cry, too, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have a problem with it. It's interesting the way you get to the point, though, because, as I said, you know, you have these two characters, and in a similar situation in mm -hmm. 1 plus 1, and they are so far apart, but part of the way they get together is the way I like to get together with people. Some people don't like this at all. Is you banter with each other? Yeah. You kind of insult each other, like exactly. I, like just like I was just doing with you just now. Yeah. And um, that means we're not getting we're not getting married or anything, right? No, no, that's all right. Okay. Just safe. So that banter back and forth works really well with some people, but what it, you're really saying obliquely before you get to that point is, I love you. And uh, you know, I've been doing this with my brothers all their lives, mm -hmm. and I realize I've been thinking I've been saying I love you, and they think I'm saying I despise you. So. No, I think that's really interesting, and, and what I'm, I'm really happy to hear that because um, in England we do have quite a lot of bleak humor, and you know that is how we talk to each other, and I wanted to write books where even husband and wives banter. You know, I, it, me and my husband, we can be kind of 
pretty cruel to each other in a funny way um but it's it's part of our relationship and it's part of who we are and, and we both know that it's kind of underpinned by kindness and i would never kind of deliberately hurt him but when i first put out me before you over here i think a lot of um, american people thought that lou's father in particular was cruel to her and i was thinking well no it's just the way that he expresses his love that banter and in fact my own father still signs his cards to me you know he signs to brat number one because <laughs> i'm the eldest of his daughters and you know perhaps to an outsider that seems horrible but i know that's just his affectionate way of talking to me so i guess i just wanted to to represent how people i knew kind of joked with each other i guess yeah it's like my father he called me a <laughs> His favorite name for me was just Jackass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's said with love. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. It took me several years of therapy to recognize sure. that. <laughs> yeah, but, we all go through that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, you know. You love these combinations, like like with Lou and Will. Mm -hmm. Not not only are they different in terms of their status in the world, but at first they kind of seemingly despise each other's character. Well, I think, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but in the UK, one of the things that fascinates me is the kind of growing divisions between the haves and have nots in our society. And there's a kind of great deal of mistrust on both sides. You know, everybody has ideas about how the other half lives. And with um, Lou and Will, it was really a class thing. You know, you have a lack of ambition with Lou. She's one of these girls who's going to live in the same zip code her whole life, not really care, because she's never wanted to be anything else. And, and in Will, you've had one of these highly educated, ambitious young men who's been encouraged to believe that he can conquer the world, and he pretty well has. Um, and I guess with one plus one, I was more interested in money than class. Um, if you look at it on the face of it, Jess, who's the cleaner, looks like she should be the lower of the pair. But actually, her mother was a teacher. It's just because she had a teenage pregnancy that she kind of fell out of the, I don't know, the safety net of what education should have offered her. Um, and I was interested in, in the fact that, you know, Ed, although he's, he's one of these dot-com whiz kids who's been kind of amazingly uh, successful at so software and become somebody who's rich beyond his dreams, but has also with it a lack of common sense, a lack of practical and business sense that gets him into a heap of trouble. But his family, you know, his dad was a military policeman. So I, in theory, these two people should have started off roughly on the same level but once money gets involved uh you know jess has no way of making it back up to anything like his level because society is stacked against you it's funny when i talked earlier about the coterie of characters you know it's like you don't think much about ed's father throughout the entire book mm -hmm. but then he turns out to be a real you know a, a wonderful person as he's in a very difficult situation well, you know, I think we never are too old to seek our parents' approval. You know, I'm 44, and, and um, my dad emailed me this morning, and I, I sort of sat there with a big grin on my face for about an hour afterwards, which is, you know, kind of pathetic. But um, I just, you know, I wanted to look at that and the fact that we often are far more afraid of those conversations than we need to be, because if you actually just fess up to your parents about something that's gone wrong, most of the time they will be supportive, and, and this is the case in this book. This, that's what happened with my son and I today, and of course it was done by text, which is horrible, but because um, it should have been letters back and forth, like real life. Like carrier pigeons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he had some issues, and I wrote back saying, you know, I am so proud of what you've done. I, I couldn't imagine anyone better doing what you're doing right now, and you know, it, I know it makes him feel good, but it also makes me feel good too. Yeah. But anyway, I was going to tell you so. The, the thing that where you did with uh, one plus one that was really good is when Ed is trying to explain to Jess and Tansy um, how his system works. You know, you only take this tiny, tiny bit of money away from someone. Mm -hmm. And then Tansy, who's like the coolest kid in the world, you know, figures out exactly how much. How much yeah. <laughs> how he, much, <laughs> that that's was, it. Ed has created this software that um, will enable us to kind of uh, c do all our transactions cashlessly using a mobile phone. And every transaction will cost a tiny amount of money, like a couple of cents. And to him, you know, this is how I wanted to demonstrate this divide. To him, that's nothing. You know, the, you pay a couple of cents for the convenience of not having to have a, a wallet full of bills or coins. And to a family that's living on the breadline, the loss of a couple of cents in every transaction is, is a bit of a disaster. And, 
yeah, Tansy, who's this math genius, just sort of gently skewers him with math when, when he tries to say it will mean nothing to them, and she points out exactly what it will mean to them, and the scene ends kind of uncomfortably. But I loved writing that scene uh, uh, because uh, it says everything about the two sides. And it, you get she, the way she gives variations <laughs> of the yeah. possible methods you could have the money. Yeah, she's such a sweetheart. But I will, oh. I will tell you this. If I had a brand new Audi, <laughs> I, if I yeah. I would not one I would not have taken that dog I would have found the kennel for him because that dog is a mess. Well, I mean, you know the, the dog has become the hilarious unexpected outcome of this book. Yeah, basically the the book is a road trip book and they bring along a large disgusting drooling dog called Norman who pretty much comprehensively trashes the inside of this immaculate you know bachelor Audi basically. But I I I started writing this book and I. D deliberately didn't want to turn him into one of those kind of lassie characters. You know, I didn't want to make him super intelligent and empathetic and all those things that fictional animals often are. And one night I, I was finishing a scene where something very bad happens to Norman, which you will know about having read the book. Mm -hmm. And I went to bed and I like going on Twitter and I just happened to tweet before I went to bed, oh, I can't decide whether to kill the dog. <laughs> and when I woke <laughs> up in the morning, having turned my phone off, there were about a hundred messages going, do not kill the dog. And nobody had read the book yet. Nobody, and he was a fictional dog. But it, it really showed me how important fictional animals are to people. And, and weirdly, so many people now email me or write to me about how much they love Norman. And it just never, never fails to amaze me. Because he is disgusting. I want to go back to some more disgusting things in the car, but that <laughs> reminded me of something. You know what? You ever hear that book called The Art of Racing in the Rain? Uh, I don't know it, no. Well, it's, it's told from a dog's point of view. Okay. And we carry summer reading in our bookstore, and one school recommended it in the nonfiction section. Okay. And I was thinking, it's told by a dog, it's not nonfiction, which yeah. I kind of, I was wondering what had happened. Never mind. Anyway, so not only is the dog there, but Tansy, who's going to her maths Olympiad, throws up if the car goes over 40 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Ed has this horrible incident in which I can only imagine what that must have been like. So the inside of the car would, would have been, I don't think it's, po I don't think I could have possibly been inside that car. It's, was, it's disgusting. Okay, well to be, to be fair, Ed does not do a disgusting thing in the car. Well no, he doesn't do it in the car, but still, nonetheless, I've been, you know. No, no, it's, it's not a fun place to be after a few days, I think. But you know, you, you're a family man, obviously. You know what it's like, a family day trip. You say, we're going to have a great trip. We're going to load up the car in the morning. We're going to take a picnic, and we're going to have a really fun day out. You tell me what happens within about you know, an hour of leaving home. Somebody feels sick and has their head out the window. Somebody else has sat on a chocolate bar, and it's kind of rubbed into the cream upholstery. I know Two it kids all. are elbowing each other in the back, going, you know, you're in my space. You're in my space. Um, somebody else is saying, when are we here? When are we going to get there? Yeah, I have exactly. to pee. And yeah. I just, I just love the way that when you get to your final destination, um, that that basically, uh, it's never what, you know, it, the car is trashed. It's full of crisp packets and and all the rest of it. And I just, I just love playing with that idea. Yeah, you did, a, you did a great job with that. Thank and, you. And also all the different places that they stayed, which are all relatively hideous too. I, <laughs> you well, know. that's what happens if you have no money. You know? <laughs> I like the way the proprietor of the place was trying to semi come on to Ed, and the way Jess rolled her eyes suggestively. You know, and when they, um, the one who. Well, we've all met people like that. Yeah, yeah, that was really funny. How come you gave Jess such small feet? I kept thinking of her falling over all the time. Sorry, say that again. Why did you get Jess such small feet? Because I kept thinking, imagining her falling over all the time without. Oh, do you know what? There was no specific reason for that. Um, I just, yeah, I just pictured her as being quite slight but wiry and, and you know, or maybe it's because I've got quite small feet myself and I can still get into children's shoes. <laughs> ah, so it's autobiographical. There you go. Um, yeah, so she's like 27, right? She's yeah. tiny. And uh, and she's, real, oh, and uh, tell about how, she, why she wears her flip-flops in the spring. Okay, well, she's, she's, Jess is one of life's optimists. She's one of these people who who always believes that the sun is going to come out, um, which is pretty much the opposite of me. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of life's natural catastrophists. Uh, I, I, I need to know the emergency exit everywhere I go. 
And um, I just, she wore, she wears flip-flops every day because she's convinced that even when it's cold, tomorrow is going to be warmer. So that's why she wears them. And Ed finds this incredible. He cannot believe that somebody would wear flip-flops when it's freezing out. And I just thought it was kind of an interesting metaphor for the kind of person she was. And don't you just want to, well, I, I wanted to kick the crap out of the Fisher family so badly. And maybe that's why I end up crying, because you just draw me into that. I mean, I really physically felt like, just like Jess felt, I wanted to get up, go out my door, find their house, and just beat the well, crap. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. But, you know, we all know people like that. We all know people who, who get away with just be, behaving so badly again and again and again. And, you know, I think most neighborhoods, unless they're extremely nice, have a family like that, who are the the people who you avoid on the sidewalk or who, you know, create trouble and everyone just kind of sighs and goes, oh, it's the so-and-so family, you know. Um, but it, I think I, I was kind of interested in looking at bullying these days because, you know, when I was a kid, you, you might get shoved around in a playground, but then that was it. At the end of the day, you went home and you were safe and you just had to worry about it again the next day. But these days, kids cannot escape it. You know, it follows them home on mobile homes, uh, mobile phones, on Facebook, uh, on Twitter. And, I, you know, I have two teenagers and a, and a younger kid. And when they tell me stories about the way kids find to torment each other now, for the most bizarre reasons, it just, yeah, it, it, it saddens me, really. Well, you know, what's interesting, well, first of all, there's other social platforms you and I will never even know about. Oh, sure. Which oh, no, is, they change every week. I know. It's horrible. And then the other thing is you talk about hacking into a Facebook page, and you realize, and I realize, that I could hang up, you could hang up. I could create a Facebook page for you. You could create one for me. Exactly. It's very, very strange. And um, it's Yeah, and, and we adults can only try to keep up with I, what everybody else is doing. I thought I would always ride the crest of the wave because I'm kind of technological. And I thought, okay, I'll always try and stay ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. But then one day yeah, it just... Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, well, yeah, it happened one day. And I can almost remember the exact moment. But it's a shame, and you've talked about this in interviews, when kids who have all this potential are just boxed out. And in America, you know, you have people like Dick Cheney or George Bush going, well, you know, if you just work hard enough, you can make your way out. Well, I'd like to see George W. Bush in the slums being the person he is. I don't well, this is exactly the point I wanted to make in this book, which was that that was the message I grew up with, which is if you work hard, my parents told me if you work hard and you're a good person, you will succeed. And I think, the, you know, I'm, I'm a little older than everybody and, and well, not, not everybody. Not but me. Don't people. ever say that to someone who's 20 years older than you. You, well, <laughs> you don't sound it. <laughs> but, you, you know, I think we, perhaps you and I both were lucky enough to grow up in generations where that actually was the case. It was. But where I'm growing up, you know, where my kids are growing up, it's not the case anymore. And so you, I wanted to take a kid who was as naturally talented and gifted as Tansy, who comes from a family with all those attributes, you know, hardworking, uh, determined, good character, and say, what happens to those kids when society is already stacked against them? You know, know. What, what happens to all that ambition? It, it, it dissipates. I know, and there's all these people we don't even know about who could be all these things, and they never get the chance. And you can say, well, they could, but Tansy doesn't have that type of ability. She has other abilities. But yeah, she, she doesn't and also, you know, she wins a scholarship to a school, which is offering her 90% of her fees. Well, if you live on the breadline, finding 10% of that money is pretty much as hard as finding 100%. Um, and I, I, that's what I think people with money cannot possibly conceive what it's like to live literally juggling your bills and trying to work out how you're going to put food on the table every day. And also how those families are often written about in fiction as a problem. And I didn't want them to be a problem. I just wanted to say this is how some people live. This is how hard it is for them to get ahead. You know, if, the other thing I thought of is if you could have just gotten Nicky to lose the mascara, he might have avoided a lot of his troubles. Well, that, but that was part of it, exactly. Why should he have to lose the mascara? You know, that's exactly what everybody says. Make life easy on yourself. Look like everybody else. Be like everybody else, and then the bullies will leave you alone. Well, I guess the kids I'm kind of interested in are the ones who just go, no, actually, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable with who I am. I would just like everybody else to be comfortable with who I am. You know, he's not doing anyone any harm. And funny enough, by the end of the book, he's made his own choices, and he's probably dropped the mascara and become a little more conventional but um you know those are the kids who fascinate me who just have such a strong sense of self that they refuse to, to be anybody else you know also you're like me in another way which is um 
that once you crack, and with Nikki it's true, um, with Ed it's true, um, it's true in me before you, is once you crack the moment where you can make someone smile, mm -hmm. even slightly, and you, and you do that a lot, where Nikki smiles slightly, or when, they, when he laughs and she says it's the first time she's heard that laugh, uh, 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 laugh in years. When you get to that point, you know things are changing in your books. I wonder, oh, that's interesting. I wonder how that came about, because it's so true. I mean, even when I'm attracted to a person, I'm attracted first, not their physical features, but their ability to laugh, their sense of humor. It's the first thing. Oh, that's, well, do you know, nobody's ever asked me that before, but yes, you're right, that happens in both books, because Lou manages to get Will to start smiling again. Um, yeah, I guess it feels, you know, I'm sure all comedians say the thing that makes them feel most powerful in the world is making somebody laugh. Um, yeah, it's the same. I've only just started writing humor in my books. Uh, really? I, I wrote eight, uh, eight books before I introduced humor. And perhaps it's not coincidental that the sales have suddenly gone crazy um, because I think people like to feel stuff. They like to laugh. They like to cry. Um, with me before you, I knew I had to put some humor because the, the subject matter was so potentially dark um, that it had to be leavened with some, some serious lightness as well. Um, but again, you know, who has the best jokes in the world? The emergency services. It goes naturally with the two things go together. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'm just that, that's what fascinates me too. I love it when people say they laughed or they cried. It makes me feel like I've taken them somewhere just out of their daily lives. I think your book's doing much better now because you stick, you put more sex in them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, my, my American editor keeps saying to me, you have to write sexier books. And I say to her, you know, I live in a tiny village in England and I've written a lot of books and I've covered a whole range of topics from aircraft carriers to whale watching to, you know, stolen artworks. And I can tell you that no one comments at all about any of your research until you write a sex scene. And then you can walk into the playground to pick up your kids the next day and all the mums will look at you like, we know what you're doing. Um, and so, yeah, unless I move to a city, I, I don't think I can write anything any sexier. Well, you know, but you did a really good job because it's much better and more titillating um, to not have... Everything. Yeah, and, and, yeah, I agree. And it's like when Jess does what she. I'm, I, I don't want to give away anything. Yeah, yeah. But when Jess does what she does, and not as rebuffed, but that is such a. You know, it is a very sexual scene, but you don't really say anything. No, but, no, but also I think it's kind of. I liked writing that scene because it was messy. You know, it, it, it's not a scene where Ed suddenly realizes his true feelings for Jess and takes her in his arms, and it's all a natural progression. What it is, is it's a slightly drunk, lonely woman who lets her guard down for a minute and goes, actually, let's just, you know, let's just make a huge mistake. And Ed is the one who goes, mm, I'm going to be a gentleman here and say no. Uh, and to me, that, as you say, that's kind of far sexier than, than just the conventional kind of what you would expect from a romance novel, True. I guess. But I also said, you idiot. You <laughs> idiot. What's wrong with you? Well, I think he kind of says that to himself. Yeah, he well. does. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, in Me Before You, you have this situation where there really is this, and it comes a little earlier than in One Plus One, where there it really is this mutual, it's like, you know what it's like? It's like um, in a lot of your situations where, like the car drive, this was the best few days I've ever had, mm -hmm. or in Me Before You, this is the best six months of my life. Mm -hmm. And they both agree. And then, but you, the reader, even though you're, you've been writing with them, it's, it hasn't been. I mean, and that's why I say the material world, the day-to-day -day waking reality. In the material world, in the day-to-day -day waking reality, this can't be the best four days in this, in this car going to Scotland. This can't be the best six of my, month of, of my life when I'm in this situation. But you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like it doesn't have to be. It doesn't. But, you know, I think some people just have that moment of awareness where they just it's most of us kind of sleepwalk through life and, and we're not mindful of where we are in it. And then every now and then you have those little moments of clarity where you go, this is so good or I am so lucky or something. You know, I just want to engrave this on my mind. To remember it forever and I think in both those cases you have people who were for whatever reason kind of asleep and then 
wake up to the fact that something good has happened. And I think that, you know, it's, it's part of maturing, I guess. Yeah, I'm interviewing this guy. I think it's next week. I've forgotten the name of the book. I'm sorry. But it's about darkness and how most of us haven't been in darkness our, during our lives because we live in cities where there's lights everywhere. And so you don't ever get into a situation where you, the Milky Way is, actually looks like mil milk smeared across the mm -hmm. sky. And he talks about how we've lost all of that. And there's a scale, like from one to eight, and we've never been above a four, almost all of us in our life. And oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I, well, funny enough, we live on a farm in the middle of nowhere, so uh, we get a lot of visitors from the city who just say, I can't sleep because it's too dark and it's too quiet and it's freaking me out. So, <laughs> yeah, we're the opposite. Yeah, he talks about looking up in the sky where he goes and you can see the satellites just coursing across the sky and you just constantly see meteors. Wow. And, you know, it's, um, it's, but like, like you said, people walk around looking at the ground. People don't look up at night and see the stars. They don't see the moon. And um, I think your books, um, in a different way, um, show that. They show that, you know, all, especially like for Jess' situation, she's been going for three and a half years without having any emotional or intimate mm -hmm. attachments. And as Ed says, that's like one-fourth of your adult life. Yes. And, uh, he helpfully points that out, yeah. Well, that's one of, yeah, that's one of the things. Hey, you really haven't for one-fourth of your life. That's great. Good job. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and she takes it, you know? And that's what's so good about it. You know, that's, those are your characters. You've decided you're going to do it that way. Are you always going to do it that way? Uh, you know, it's different with every book. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, my characters are always messy. They are always flawed people. They try their best, but they get themselves into situations because that's what interests me. I'm not interested in people with perfect lives who always do the right thing. I'm interested in the gray areas where, you know, most people, even people who do really bad things, think that they're doing the right thing, and, and sort of that's what interests me. So, yeah, I, I will keep writing those sorts of characters. Um, having discovered that I really like writing stuff with humor in it, I will probably continue to do some of that and, um, yeah, hopefully make you laugh and maybe cry a bit too. Uh, does that mean I have to read the next one now? Uh, yeah, just invest know. in Kleenex. Oh, look, <laughs> look, see, there's right there. That's right there. Exactly that is what we just did. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't know what I was going to say. Anyway, it's just a very interesting way of writing because it's kind of my life too, and I don't know whether. Well, I guess you 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 do say you say that's how your life is too in terms of communication. A lot of times, you and your husband, for example. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we uh, we kind of we we uh, joke at each other, you know, and sometimes um, obviously you can be kind of more serious, but. Most people I know do not speak to each other like two people in the pages of a romance novel. You know, oh my gosh, you look so beautiful tonight. I can see the stars in your eyes, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it just, you know, they're much more likely to say, uh, you know, do you fancy a quickie? Oh, oh okay, if you um, put the wash on. <laughs> That's not me and my husband. <laughs> well, so now people in your village will hear this. I know, I'm just thinking, thank goodness this is actually in the States. <laughs> no, I'll send it, I'll send it over there. <laughs> Oh dear. I don't think Jess did anything. I mean, all the reviews are going, you know, you make one tragic mistake. I don't, Jess didn't do anything bad. I mean, I don't think. I mean, I don't, I, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess, yeah, it depends. This is the never endingly interesting thing for me as a writer is that all readers put something different into their books. So some people think that what she did is atrocious. Other people go, well, that's totally understandable. Um, I think it all depends where you're coming from. Yeah, and that's, you know, you have the book club questions at the end, kind of. Um, oh, wait a minute, do you? Do you have book club questions at the end of the book? I can't remember. Uh, I, know this, I, I know the Penguin have got some. I don't know if they're on the website or in the back of the book, because I'm afraid I don't have a copy of the book on me right this minute. Um, yeah. But I know there are some. Yeah, I don't usually like those, but I, because I think in your books, I think book clubs will, I, I'm sure you know, I, I'm sure you've seen this, but you're, book clubs will just automatically take sides and go back and forth and this is a good book to do that in. I would like to sit in, and our book club will definitely do this one, I think. Oh, thank you. One I'm delighted to hear that. Hey, how come it's one plus one, but in England it's the one plus one? 
Oh, it, it's just personal preference of the two different publishers. Um, I think uh, every publisher um, knows their own market best, and I think the um, American branch of Penguin thought that it would work better as one plus one over here. So um, given that it wasn't a huge difference, but, you know, I agreed to it. Yeah, it's funny how publishers are kind of smart, you know. I mean, look at your covers now. I yeah. wouldn't I wouldn't say they're like the most perfect covers in the world, but people who come into our bookstore, they know how to find you. They do. And do you know what the thing I like about them is that they are kind of neutral. You right. know, they don't say these are for men, these are for women, these are this kind of book or that kind of book. Hopefully because, you know, I write very different books usually. If you read more than two, you'll see that they're kind of, most of them are, some are historical, some are set in different sorts of places. Um, and and traditionally, that's been a bit of a problem for me as far as marketing goes, because you can't make my covers look the same. But this is so neutral, you know, just the words and the background, that actually I think it works a lot better. And, and obviously, thank, you know, thanks to American readers, it seems to be working over here. Oh, in our bookshop, your books just fly off the shelves. It's ridiculous. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, you know, so with, with Tansy, you know what I wanted more of was with, when, remember when Ed posits that problem to Tansy about the mm -hmm. socks in the drawer? Yeah. And you must not, you had to find an answer somewhere because you don't know that much about math. I do not know that much about math. And in fact, researching the math so that I could uh, look at abstract mathematical concepts in a language that a 10 year old girl might use was one of the hardest parts of the book. Um, luckily, my husband is, is much better at, he's kind of an engineer brain. He writes about technology. So he, he was able to translate some of the problems that I found. And so, yeah, we, we would, for example, exactly put, put a, an abstract mathematical concept and translate it into a sock drawer or, you know, something similar. But that's the thing I love about writing different characters is that, you know, you, you have to see the world as somebody else would see it. So, for example, I once had friends who were violinists, and I realized after knowing them for a bit that they, their entire world was through what they heard, whereas my world is through what I see. And with Tansy, it meant that I had to start looking at, you know, the bricks on a wall or the row of bottles lined up on a shelf and, and see it how a 10-year-old obsessed with numbers would see it. And so, I, I, you know, I did a lot of research on young maths prodigies, and luckily there was a documentary series in England at the time, so I managed to get hold of videotapes of that. And I just looked at how they saw things, because it was so far removed from how I see things that it was kind of mind-blowing. Yeah, I know. It's like um, these kids who memorize pi to 10,000 digits. Exactly, exactly. And you know in their mind these numbers are just dancing about with colors yeah. and auras, and that's how they do it. And it's like when, when Tansy's talking about, you know, <laughs> I like the way she just kind of, you know, interrupts the conversation by going, you know, there's imaginary numbers and there's irrational numbers, which don't really exist, but if you add them up and do this, you still get minus one, you know? <laughs> well, this is... Yeah, and this is what I love about the way kids talk, is that actually this thing has been going on in their head without you, you know, any reference to you, and then it just pops out like a little sort of eruption. I mean, my, my nine-year-old is like that. Sometimes he'll come down uh, to breakfast and he'll start talking about, you know, um, what kind of dinosaurs lived when, and or he'll ask you some question about why the earth turns the way it does and you're thinking i just need a cup of coffee but um <laughs> yeah it's the way kids minds work it's great well unfortunately my youngest i have a whole batch of different children but my youngest uh, annie who's 13 unfortunately she's very similar to me so she approaches these things from a different angle much like your characters like one time i work out twice a week with the trainer and uh -huh. I, I bought this sleeveless, I mean, I'm old. I bought this sleeveless shirt and looking uh -huh. in the mirror thinking, wow, I look, this is good. I look, you know, pretty good for my age. So I turn around, I see Annie in the, in the corner of the room with her arms folded over her chest. And she looks at me, she goes, do you think you look good in that? Oh, and there's nothing <laughs> as crushing as a 13-year-old. But she says it, and she's just like one of your characters. There's, You know there's a smile there, and she just knows how to get you. She finds your weak spot and just pushes yeah. in a little bit. They know the soft bits. <laughs> they know where to go. Yeah. So anyway, so I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. It was great talking to you about all this stuff. Well, thank you so much, and I'm so glad you enjoyed them, especially being a man and all. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I wouldn't have picked them up but for this show, and I'm so glad that I did, and I'm so glad that you've been so successful, too. You deserve oh. it. 
You're very kind. Thanks for having me. Okay, next book, uh, I'll, I'll read it for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure they send you one. <laughs> no, all right, thanks. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So that was Jojo Moyes talking about her two books that I didn't want to like but I loved, Me Before You, which is in paperback, and One Plus One, which just came out in hardback this month, uh, Penguin. And, you know, it's like I don't want to read romance books, but as I told her, it was just they suck you in. I mean, literally from page one, literally from the first paragraph. You know you're going to like it. You know you're going to like the characters. And I don't know how she, it's like magical. Um, it is not something I would pick up. But the, their covers are almost like trademarks because you can. It's, it's like the girl with the dragon tattoo or something or diversion. You can look at the covers. You know you can walk in from and see from across the room. It's, it's her book. It's one of her books. And there's like 10 or 12 of them. Anyway, so I, that, that was a lot of fun. Anyway, so next week, completely different. Uh, John Micklethwaite, who is the editor-in-chief of The Economist magazine, which is a great magazine. Sometimes people think it's really conservative, but I don't necessarily think it is. And you know my, le my uh, political leanings by now. So his new work, he w wrote with his um, co-editor, I've forgotten the guy's name. It's called The Fourth Revolution, The Global Race to Reinvent the State. So basically it presents a very authoritative and global perspective on the present state of political dysfunction, both here in you know, Greece, Italy, Spain, um, Ukraine, and, and, and the global attempts they talk about to reinvent the state, to reinvent the state so there's not that great disparity between um, wealth, you know, the 1% and 99%, and also so that, um, uh, so that we can rise to equal the educational and ed economic things that are happening around the world, especially he talks about Singapore a lot. It used to be that other countries attempted to copy our political process, our democracy, but there are no countries in the world now, he states, that are attempting to adopt our economic program. They feel that our economic program is abysmal, so they adopt their own. And um, they now have Sweden and Singapore, apparently, that provide them that template with which they can um, start an economic revolution in their own countries. Th these guys are a lot more optimistic about this happening. I'm like Jojo. I'm not fatalistic, but it seems to me like it's going to be a lot harder than they feel to reinvent the political process in the United States, and for that matter, the world. But anyway, great guy, fascinating, super, super, super intelligent, and um, I think you'll really love listening to that. And I hope it's, like I said, it's completely opposite of this one, and that's what's so great about the show, that I get to do that. Anyway, so blah, 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 I keep blabbing away, but um, I had a great time talking to JoJo today, and I hope you keep tuning in. And remember now you can, we have our own channel on YouTube where you can listen to these things with, um, my uh, web person, uh, Christine Bernstein, has done such a great job. So you can see some visual stuff in addition to listening to the interview on YouTube. And, of course, you can always go to iTunes and type in just Jojo Moyes. And for whatever reason, iTunes puts us way up there. And so does Google, too, because Google owns YouTube. So when we put a, um, a broadcast up on YouTube, it goes to the top of the Google thing. If I get a book early enough, I'll be on top of Amazon, so to speak. And I will also be ahead of the New York Times book review. And um, that's been a big plus for the bookstore. So speaking of which, come into the bookstore. Um, we've made it better and better and better. It's just off of the Turnpike across from a new uh, Hilton Garden Inn, so you can't miss it. And uh, just above Brickside Restaurant and down the strip um, from Nudie's Restaurant. So we look forward to seeing you there. Come on in. Uh, if you want to join our book club, we have great books um, that we have 20 or 30 people in our book clubs, plus other book clubs meet there as well. And, um, okay, I think that's enough, don't you? So join us again next week, and um, I thank you all for listening to the show. It's really made a difference in my life, and it's really helped out the bookstore a lot. So, talk to you next week on The Avid Reader. You've been listening to The Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.